So uh, I'm Nick Nisi, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, building RESTful services with Node. And uh, this is me. Um, I work for a company called Pollenware on a product called C2FO. And there's my GitHub repo, Twitter. Uh, these slides and all demo code uh, are out on GitHub right now. Um, I'll have links to them later, and I'll probably tweet them. <clears throat> so um, what is Node.js? I kind of took a beginner's uh, stance on this because uh, I didn't know with how many people were coming, I didn't know the, the skill range uh, that we were going to see. So um, it was invented in 2009 by Ryan Dahl, <clears throat> and it's currently maintained by uh, Joint, and uh, it's in pretty active development. Uh, so what is it? It is JavaScript on the server, um, asynchronous I.O. and event-driven, so it's a little different than uh, how you're normally accustomed to writing server-side code. Uh, and it's built on top of Google's V8, so uh, their JavaScript engine. And cool. Here's the, the website. Um, and, and there's their description of what it is down there. It's kind of hard to read uh, on that screen, so I'll read it. Node.js is a platform built on Chrome's JavaScript runtime for easily building fast, scalable network applications. Node uses event-driven, non-blocking I.O. model that makes it lightweight and efficient, perfect for data-intensive real-time apps that run across distributed services. So there's pros and cons to uh, using Node. And uh, that tweet by Adam came by, I think, on Tuesday. Uh, and it kind of got me thinking, because I just kind of had like a, a cheery slide that said, like, JavaScript is fun. You should want to write it. And then I, after seeing that, I kind of started thinking about, like, why would you really want to write JavaScript on the front, on the, the server? And uh, I did a Google search, and there's a screenshot of it right there. Why Node.js? And after NPM and the Node site, uh, it's kind of hard to read. But um, the first one is why Node.js is cool. And the second one is why Node.js is absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of split. Um, and so I, I was going to open it up to uh, anybody if they want to throw out pros and cons uh, as to why they might want to use it. First off, does ever, has anybody used Node here? OK, so quite a few. And so why did you look at Node? Well, look into it. And have you used it on something big, small? Code sharing. Code sharing? OK. Like? Between the server and the client. Oh, OK, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, you can. Um, is that listed under here? No, it is. Yeah. I still I read that. <laughs> <laughs> so th those are the pros and cons I came up with. Um, one thing for me that that, and I'll I'll get into it a little later, is that when you want to do things like a simple database call, and or a couple of simple database calls, you it, like in Ruby or another language, it's just really simple. I just say query this, and I get the results back and continue on. With Node, I kind of have to query it, give it a callback to run, and then inside of that callback, if I need to use the data to make another query, do it again and again, and so on. And uh, it's called callback hell. So talk about it a little bit. Uh, so quickly, installing Node.js, uh, you can get it from their site uh, right here. Uh, a really simple binary uh, to install and run uh, for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And then um, you can also build it from source, so just clone it on GitHub, pull it down. Uh, and you can also install it from Homebrew on OS X uh, with that brew install node. <clears throat> I currently just have it installed from the binary. So getting started, <laughs> uh, here's a simple hello world uh, example written in node. Um, I just put a screenshot up there. So when you type node, on, when you have it installed and you type it in your terminal, um, you just get a REPL. And so right there, I'm just doing a couple of console.logs and some really simple math. And then um, in, in the first example, and then in the second example, I'm executing a file um, called hello.js. And it's basically doing the same thing, except it puts the, the 2 plus 2 inside of console.log, so it shows up. Uh, you can also access other files. Uh, so in this example, I have um, a user.js that contains the code on top and the hello.js down on the bottom. And um, 
So with that module.exports, I'm making it available um, when it's required in down there. And so I can just say new user and all of that runs. I have an example of that, so I can whip out some code. Um, I think this is it here. So there it is, just using user.js. And here is user. And then when I run it, you can see, did that run? OK, technical difficulties. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, there's also NPM. Uh, it's Node's package management system, and it comes installed with Node. So when you get that binary or build it or whatever, you also get an NPM executable. And uh, it's great for, for getting uh, all of the packages you need for, for um, your applications, but you can also get a lot of cool utilities for it, like these. Anybody use any of these? Awesome. Um, that's socket IO on the bottom. And uh, yeah, so you can install there. When you do npm install the package name, it creates a node modules directory in the directory that you're calling it from and puts it in there. And when you do npm install dash g, it puts it into user local. I don't know where it goes on Windows. Um, don't care. <laughs> <laughs> sure, there you go. <laughs> um, this is a, a sample package.json. It was generated for me, uh, I think, with Express. But um, in here, uh, this gets like checked in with, with uh, our project. By the way, C2FO is a 100% node app. So that's what we're working on all day, every day. And um, so we have a, a file like this, but it's a lot bigger and a lot more complex. Uh, but we have, the main part in there is that dependencies. Uh, and you can see in this one, I have Express 305, less middleware, any version, and handlebars middleware. Uh, I don't know if it's called considered middleware. Yeah, sure. Um, so when I run npm install without any other arguments, it uh, looks for a package.json and it finds it. So it'll install those three in that directory or in, into a, a node modules directory in that directory. Um, what does that represent? I mean, obviously, it means something private, but I does that mean? don't. So, if you do an NPM publish, it won't publish. Is that just like a oops? Yeah, so like in our private repos, or like all our private modules, we say private true, uh -huh. and it'll prevent us from accidentally publishing it to the, to the public repository. OK. Well, that makes sense. Cool. There's also another one. I didn't show it in here, but there's dev dependencies. And so you can put that uh, in there and then uh, specify that you only want these to be installed when you're in development. Um, examples of that are like, um, right now we're using less middleware um, in development just so we can quickly compile our less, but it'll be static on the server and won't ever be used. So that's a, a simple example. It, it that would actually be under dev dependencies. And I think you can do npm install dash dash when you do npm install dash dash save, it adds it to the package.json. Uh, if you do npm install dash dash save dev, I think it adds it to the dev dependencies. So uh, now I'm going to talk about um, Express. Uh, Express is a um, web application framework for Node. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's kind of similar to uh, like Sinatra, if you've used that or uh, others. Um, but it, it lets me quickly create RESTful routes and give them, give them callbacks to execute when those routes are hit. And uh, has uh, quick plugins for you know, compiling templates and, uh, and all of that. And, and using middleware, it's built on top of Connect, which is kind of like uh, Ruby's rack. Um, I think. So creating a new Express app, uh, you can just install it globally. Uh, so you get a global binary call, uh, called Express. And then you can just say Express app. And you get an output like that. It creates all of those files for you by default. So I'll run that and give a um, I'll 
I'll run the help. So you can specify a couple of exam uh, of couple of um, flags for it. You can tell it that you want to use less or stylus, uh, Jade, Hogan, which is a mustache-like templating library. Uh, you can tell it that you you need session support, uh, automatic, so it'll automatically add the middleware for that uh, and set it up. So if I do express dash h dash c plus plus less dash sessions and call it foo. Oops. If I can spell, there we go. So now I can go to foo, and I've got all of these uh, boilerplate files created, the main one being this app.js. And in here, it gets set up. I'm going to go through this a little, in a little more um, depth. But it also creates uh, a package.json for me with the dependencies of Express, Hogan, and less middleware. So now I don't have those installed. As you can see, I don't have a node modules, but if I do an NPM install, then all of a sudden I have a node modules directory with all of those installed in there. <clears throat> um, so here's an example of a really, really simple Express server. Um, it's only two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. Uh, and I have that in code that I can run just to kind of, I'll walk through it with that. Uh, so in here, uh, here's the, the really simple app, same code, uh, where I'm specifying a get route of slash, and it gets this call, it, it, you pass it a callback that gets a request and response object and then I can just tell it to respond with this simple text and start up a, you, you create a new Express instance and tell it to listen on port 3000. So when I run that, um, and then if I just do a get to 127.0.0.1 port 3000, you can see that I get hello world back So that's, that's probably the simplest uh, Express app. And then uh, you can add middleware. So Express, like I said, is built on top of Connect. So you can add in uh, Connect middleware to it. And it's really simple. Um, I kind of highlighted and made bigger the, the code that changed from the last slide. So it would be that middleware function um, where I pass it a request, response, and a next. And so in this example, I'm reading a file from the file system called name.txt and setting it to request.name and then calling next. So next is uh, a function that lets you do asynchronous calls. So in um, app.get slash foo, I, I say first I need to run that middleware and then I can continue on. So you can see in that callback I need request.name. Uh, so that, that ensures that request.name gets filled in. Um, and that won't complete until next is called, which won't complete until the file has been read and the data uh, set to the request object. So back in there. Um, What's that get function from? Uh, copied it from Paul Irish's get uh, dot files. I don't know why it has that percent sign, though. I didn't have time to. It calls LWP request under the covers. It's just an alias. Um, so the simple middleware, here it is. And the other middleware right here is just, um, it's just saying that if nothing else catches it, this is going to run. So if I went to slash foo, um, that will work, but anything else will just get caught by this because I'm not specifying a, a get and slash foo. So this, it's like if it doesn't get caught first, this one will get run where I'm just returning hello, hello middleware. And oops, okay, that's fine. So if I do another get, On port 3000, 
to slash to just slash since I'm not defining it, I get uh, hello world. Is that right? Oh no, I am defining that one. So now if I do it to slash bar, because I'm not doing that, then hello middleware catches it. But if I do it to slash foo, then it's going to read name.txt, uh, which just had the string nick in it, and uh, it returns that, nick in a new line character. Uh, so it returns that. Excellent. Um, so you can also do variable URLs. Um, in this example, I'm setting a greeting and have a variable of name and another variable of location. And I'm just printing those out. And so the uh, variable URLs. So this one, uh, I'll just go to the URL, it's easier. There's the hello world. And when I do greeting in Omaha, then I just get that returned back. So just really simple um, callback execution. And Uh, you can also use templates server side. Uh, so in this example, I'm bringing in handlebars uh, via the HBS node module. And um, I'm configuring node to use it via that, that view engine, HBS. And uh, so now when I go to the, the default slash route, I'm telling it to render index.handlebars and pass it in that data. So title and name, and then over there in index.handlebars, you can see that I'm using title and name. And um, so now that's being called from a, um, or that's returning a, a actual template, so HTML. And I can see that in, in here. This is in an H1 tag. And oops. Oh, uh, slash is just redirecting to greeting. So I was just giving an, an example of uh, how you can do easy redirections in Node. So here's. Um, something interesting, like, like uh, Bruce was saying, you can, the benefit of, of having uh, something like JavaScript on the back end is you can share code between the front end and the back end. Uh, in this example, I'm uh, sharing a partial between the front end and the back end, although I didn't actually create the front end code that uses the partial, so just pretend that it does. Uh, but what I'm doing here is um, the handlebars HBS library has a register partial so I'm just using the read file sync method to read the file in. And read file sync works like you would you think it, it would in another language. It, you don't have to pass it a callback. It will just block and then return when, when the file is loaded. So I'm loading uh, the header.handlebars from my front end directory uh, and then just registering it as a partial. down. And then down here, I'm actually using that partial. Um, I think we did that in our app in the beginning, and I don't think we do it anymore, just because we've kind of started going away from uh, server-side templates altogether. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's a, a quick example. I won't run the the code just because it it's simple. But uh, you can also install other middleware. Uh, like in this example, I'm pulling in this less middleware uh, that I got from npm. And um, I'm configuring it, telling it where the source directory is. So in, uh, in this example, it's in the public directory. And then uh, I'm also telling Express where my static files are located. So that's in a public directory. That's where all of my front end images and JavaScript and uh, CSS and any other, any, any other static files would be located. <clears throat> So 
So you can see in here it's the same. And then uh, I have a public directory with a style sheets uh, directory in there and a style.less uh, where I'm just using a simple less function just so it's a little different from CSS. Um, and let me execute that. So now when I go to, uh, I think it's the greeting. Yeah. Oops. Now when I go to the greeting, oh, fail. Oh, okay. I have this sweet purple background that you probably can't see on that. But it's lighter. Yeah. It's whatever color you're using. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was 45% lighter than blue. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what that less middleware was doing is it's just looking for any request to public slash something slash dot CSS and checking to see if a less file exists there and then compiling that less and then returning the CSS. And so you can see in that, um, in that directory, I have a style that CSS right there, which is just the built, uh, the built less file. <clears throat> so is it actually building the CSS and then yep. that as the resource? So if I delete this, then refresh the page and then go back and refresh that, it's back. It just builds it every time. Um, it's kind of annoying, but we just have the CSS get ignored right now in, in that library, so we never check it in. Um, <clears throat> so I'm flying through this a little faster than I thought I would. But uh, <laughs> so um, now I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about callback hell and the promised land. <laughs> so I just did a, a search, an image search for callback hell. <laughs> and I have no, nothing to say about this. <laughs> Except that it's epic, yes. <laughs> um, so here's a quick example. I, I actually wrote another example um, app uh, that I'll show at the end, but it, I was trying to show callback hell and the app ended up being a lot simpler than I thought, so it didn't really demonstrate callback hell. Uh, <laughs> so I made something up. And in this example, uh, I'll walk through this code. Um, I'm first requiring the file system library that just comes with Node, and uh, the path.resolve, spe specifically the resolve function on the path module that comes with Node, and uh, creating an empty file data array and a interval and um, object which will be what I set my set interval. Don't judge this code. Uh, and a done bool that I can check. And then uh, finally, a, a directory where my files are located. So it's uh, the underscore underscore dir name is the directory that this file exists in. So I'm resolving that. So the directory this exists in slash files is what that ends up creating. And then, um, I'm calling file system .read dir, so I'm getting a list of files in that directory, so in the directory that the files directory that I'm specifying. And then I give it a callback, and uh, the first one, the, the first um, argument passed to it is an error, and that's either null or something. Uh, and that's pretty typical in a lot of node libraries, um, but we'll talk about a better way in a second. And uh, so the first thing I do is I check if there was an error, and if there was, then I error out. Otherwise, I loop through all of those files. So that, that files is an array of file names. I loop through that, so um, I just pass it, or I, I get a file and an index in that function, but that's run synchronously. And then I'm doing a read file and uh, resolving that, direct, or that uh, path for the file, expecting UTF-8 encoding, uh, and then passing it a callback to run when the data from that file gets back to me. So um, the next thing I do is check for an error, and if there is no error, then I have the data 
the contents of that file in data. And so I'm pushing that to that file data array. And then I'm checking to see if um, that was the last of my files. And if it is, then I say done true. There's probably a better way I could do this, but I did this like right before. Um, so then after the for each runs, then I'm running a set interval where I just check if done. And if it's not done, then I tell you it's not done yet and uh, check again in 10 milliseconds. Um, but if it is done, then that means that the file data array has all of the contents of the files in, in the array. So then now I'm going to uh, write those, the contents to a, a file called out.txt uh, where I just join that array and uh, the callback there just gives me an error whether it was, whether there was an error or not. So if there was an error then I say that I let you know what the error was. Otherwise I just uh, say done and the file ends. So I'll run that one. So that's this concat.js. And when I run it, you can see the output here. Um, by the way, the files that it's grabbing are a couple of, uh, the, the largest one, the a big ibsum, is a um, big Lebowski ibsum generator that was 500 paragraphs, so it's really big. Then uh, bad windows jokes, famous people facts, a default lorem ipsum, and three Samuel L. ipsums. And I'm just concatenating them all into a single file. And I made the big one really big and gave it a A in the beginning so that it would be read first, but showing that it's not, um, so if I go into that, no, it's actually an out.txt right there. So we can see that, Jesus man, obviously this is the big Lebowski. And it's really big. Oh, so it was written first. So never mind that. I'm not going to go into what I thought I was going to go into. But I don't know the, the, the order that those callbacks are going to complete is what I was trying to get at. So this, these could be in any order, really. Uh, yeah, so all of, the, all of the text files are concatenated into that one. So now I'll show uh, a really simple way that we kind of work around that. Um, so we use a library called Comb. Uh, it's on our um, GitHub repo. Uh, there it is. And it's like a kitchen sink library for a node. It does a ton of stuff. Uh, what I have used uh, the most out of it is the promise library. Um, and so does, it, does everybody know what promises are? I can go into it. I'll, I'll go into it, yeah. Um, <laughs> so this is our, our kind of way to, to work around the callback hell, so I'll, I'll go over it here. Um, <clears throat> so this is the same exact code, uh, or the same exact um, functionality, I guess, but just written with promises. Um, and basically, it lets us, instead of saying, um, hey, do this, and then we'll pass you a callback, and that callback will contain an error, and then the data that we want, um, we'll just give you, a, we'll just call it and expect a promise back, and then we can chain, um, we, we, we can then call on that promise, like dot then, and pass you a success and an error um, callback. And we can continue doing that, and we can do it anywhere in the file uh, and, and just know that that will get run when, when you're done processing. Uh, so in this example, um, the only difference at the top is that I'm requiring the comb library. And uh, then right there, the FSP, I'm um, doing file system promises. Uh, what I'm doing is calling comb.wrap on read dir, read file, and write file. So instead of, it, it changes, um, how they work. So instead of me passing in a, a callback to them, they just return a promise that I can then use um, 
via promise via the promise library, which lets me clean things up a little bit. Um, so on here, that let me go to there. It is. <clears throat> this is here's the the um, documentation on comb .wrap. and yeah, so it just takes any any default node um, function that follows that pattern of returning an error first and instead let, uh, returns a promise. And so back in our code, um, I'm calling comb.async.foreach. So what that's doing, and then passing it in the um, FSP reader. And so that is passing back the array of directories. And you can see I didn't have to specify a error uh, in there. I, I'm just passing in the um, that and that the the file there, and that is returning a promise, which then the async for each is waiting. And on, on each iteration, it's calling this callback right here, which lets me create a promise right there, uh, the var ret, and then I'm doing a read file, and uh, call. It, I wrapped that in in um, with, with com wrap, so it's returning a promise. So then I can say dot then. Uh, and pass it the success function. And right there, I'm pushing the file data to the array and then calling ret.callback, meaning that this promise it was successful. And then I'm returning ret.promise so that uh, outside of this code, it can't be modified, it can just be checked for. So you're putting each one of those individual, so you're looping over something there. Mm -hmm. What's, what are you looping over? I'm looping over the files, the list of files so that are in that directory. Promise for each one of those files yep. that you're reading, and then this for each is like an aggregate promise. Is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. okay. So that will tell you when all of the files have been read. Right. So then you can see down at the end of that, I say dot then, and that this gets called back after all of the files have been read in, and then after all of them, uh, after all of them have been read in, then I can call write file. And I write to out.promise.txt. And uh, then when that's done, I can just say, I, I just say the, the done. And then I pass in the error right there. Um, excuse me. And the nice thing about this is the errors will bubble from anywhere in there that throws an error, it will bubble up to that one. So I only had to specify it in one location instead of if error else. Um, write down, I don't have, oops. Uh, down at the bottom where it says function error. So the comb.async.foreach, I pass it in, well, and then the dot then. Back. It gives you a promise back, and then I say dot then, and I pass it two functions the success oh, and the error. Okay. So does that, is that similar then to like a try catch? In other words, would the then functionality not be executed if an error exists in, in the processing of any one of those? Yeah, the success wouldn't, but the error one would. Okay. You can actually throw errors just like you normally would. So, you could, so instead of having like callback and passing an error, you could actually just throw it normally and it would catch it. Okay, cool. So I just wonder if there's 100% success fail or if you get like 90% success, the then function would work. And uh, there's a method that allows you to do that, but um, by default, it's saying no. If one of them fails, they all fail. Okay. Yeah. So um, I can run that file too, and that is this one right here. Um, and so you'll see when I execute it. Oops! Totally ran the wrong thing. So now I just see done uh, because I had a lot less console.logs, but I, then I can see in here uh, that I have both the out and the out.promise, and in here, still in a different order, I didn't fix that. Um, but now the windows, the fun windows jokes are at the top. Yeah, definitely. In your previous example, you mentioned that um, the 
order was indeterministic? Yeah. Do the callback structure with the promises? Is it not in the not in the way I wrote it? Okay. There are um, this library has a lot of uh, cool functionality. Uh, I was going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, where is it? It's got a serial, um, and this will execute both synchronous and asynchronous code um, in order. So you pass it an array, and it will pass, it will do each one of those in order, and then give you a, return you a promise that you can then uh, execute code when all of those have finished. Another one just below it is dot chain, which works uh, in a very similar way, but it's going to take the whatever you return from async action one, it's going to pass it to two, which passes it to three, and so on. So the output of one will get passed to the other, and then when they're all done, that will get run. Um, this is the wrap I was talking about, and this is the for each that I used uh, in that example. There is, uh, uh, as you can see, this promise doc is really big, and there's a lot to it. Um, and that's just one part of the library, but we use this, our whole node code base is built on top of this. Promises can help manage callback hell. You can see in this example, I kind of tried to highlight how I was indenting in. Um, you, I mean, obviously, you can, go, you can get a lot worse. We were looking at a, um, a Mongo example where we were trying to get a collection and then save to that collection, and it was just crazy. Uh, but I wanted to keep it pretty simple for this. Um, and while it doesn't completely solve the problem, it, this is a lot more flat. And, uh, and um, when you start using things like chain and serial, uh, you can really do some pretty powerful stuff without um, having to write a lot of boilerplate, catching errors everywhere. And, and uh, yeah, it seems like it would have been a better way to go with Node than the callbacks. <clears throat> Chrome is open source? Yes, yeah. There's the URL for the docs, uh, which you can download it from there. And it's npm install com. Um, so I've been showing examples the whole way through, so this is a stupid slide. <laughs> uh, I, created, I, I created this um, yesterday, last night. <coughs> I thought it'd be cool to show callback hell with uh, the Twitter API, which was my first time playing with the Twitter API and the first time playing with Socket.io. And I got a really cool example working, and it was, all, it was actually too simple. It didn't really show much about callbacks. So I kept it, and I, I probably could have made it harder, but I was, I was happy with, with it. So uh, let me start it. So now, if somebody can tweet Nebraska JS, it will immediately show up on the screen here. It's pound Nebraska JS for this example. Who's going to win? <laughs> <laughs> Cody Peterson. <laughs> That's the kind of hostile work environment I have to go to every day. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is just, um, <clears throat> I, I created a Twitter uh, app, I guess, and got the credentials, and then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have to end soon. <laughs> um, so I'll kill that. <laughs> Actually, I won't. I'll, I'll keep it going. There you go. <laughs> um, but I'll go through the code here a little bit. Uh, it's really pretty simple. Oh, and then also uh, I made it so you can click on them, and I have a dynamic route that will show Cody's picture his name, his location, and his tweet count, and his user ID. 
Sorry if you didn't want me to show that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so this is, I, I used um, a lot of default libraries. Uh, and then in Twitter is what I use to connect to Twitter. Uh, and then this is my Twitter credentials, which I won't open because uh, I'm being recorded. Um, so it, this is open source on GitHub, but that file's missing. You, you just have to go fill it in. Um, and then socket.io and path, uh, which does the path.resolve, which I showed earlier. So I'm creating my server and then setting up socket.io. And this is the keyword that I'm targeting in Twitter, NebraskaJS. And then I'm just setting my log level in um, socket.io. And I, I was really impressed with how easy it was to get all this set up, because I had never touched any of this before. Uh, then in here, I'm setting up, um, I'm using handlebars here, and setting where my views are located, uh, what port I'm listening on. Express is awesome, favicon, I guess. Uh, and Express is logger. This just got set up with the default app. Same with body parser and uh, method override. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, I am, I don't, oh, I'm using less middleware too. Um, uh, and here is the actual Twitter stream info. Oh, actually, I missed it. Here, I'm creating a new Twitter with my Twitter auth, which is just reading straight in the JSON. So if you require a JSON file with Node, you just get it, it parses it, and you just get uh, an object back. So that's what I'm passing it straight into Twitter. And then getting the Twitter stream. So this is from their docs. Um, statuses filter, and then pass it uh, parameters. I'm tracking that keyword, Nebraska JS, and then when new things happen. Um, oh, no, and then, so that sets it up and creates a stream for me. And then I can say when the stream, uh, th this uses event emitters, which is another pattern, uh, similar to promises, I guess, except it can have more than just success and fail. On this one, I have data and error. Uh, and there's a couple of other ones that I'm not listening to, probably. Um, but. So I'm saying when new data comes in from Twitter, uh, then run this callback. So it, it gets the data, and I'm emitting that data. Well, I'm formatting it, calling this format, which just gets out the information I want, the text of the tweet, the image URL, and the user's name, and the user ID. And I'm just emitting that to Socket.io. And if there's an error, then I'm console logging error. So when you go to uh, the, the main route, I'm just hitting index, which is index.handlebars, which actually it loads layout.handlebars. Uh, and then index.handlebars gets loaded in here uh, where the body is. But in here, I'm just setting up um, bootstrap, which I'm loading from Bower and jQuery. And then my listener code, this is the actual code I wrote that uses socket.io. Oh, and I'm, I'm loading socket.io as well somewhere. Yeah, right there. Um, and so the socket.io library is, uh, or it has middleware that's actually catching when I request that and then returning. So you don't really have, there's no file on the server called socket.io, which is pretty cool. Um, and then here's some Twitter bootstrap crap, and then the body, and then in here I'm just, um, putting the Nebraska JS tweets and that tweet message, and then uh, create a, an unordered list called tweet list. And has anybody been adding to it? Awesome. Um, so then in the public JavaScripts listener, I just have some really simple JavaScript in a um, in, in a jQuery wrapper. So I just create my socket listening on slash, I, yeah, I think. And when new tweet happens, so that's what was happening on the front end, or on the back end, I'm sorry. I'm emitting a new tweet. So that's, this is listening for that new tweet and executing this callback when it 
when that happens, which gets the data. I'm logging, console.logging it, and then um, appending and calling the show tweet, passing it the data, which just creates my awesome list element. Uh, Leet skills there. And um, yeah, so then when the other route that I have is slash user, and when you go there, I'm just getting information about the user and um, showing it. So I'm just creating a table, well, creating an image here with their image URL, uh, a link to their Twitter username, and then their information. And yeah, it was really pretty simple. I was surprised that I got it to work, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, for fun, I was going to change it. Somebody tell me a keyword. To Kansas State. Something that people would tweet. <laughs> huh? Pearl sucks. Okay. <laughs> So now, <laughs> I guess Pearl doesn't suck. <laughs> How about cats? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the images I'm pulling are too big, obviously. Look at that. Cats, oh, there it is. <laughs> I, I think I hit it last night because it stopped working. I only had it running for a few minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, I had a screenshot in case it didn't work. <laughs> and that, that's all I had. To, are there any questions? Yeah, um, we have another awesome library, um, an ORM for Node called Patio. I don't know. Um, there it is. And I, th I believe it supports um, MySQL and Postgres right now. Uh, but it's inspired by, uh, obviously inspired by the SQL engine in Ruby, or SQL ORM in Ruby. And um, yeah, this is what we use. This is also heavily built on top of Comb, as you can see in the example right here. But uh, yeah, this is what we use. And it's, uh, we've had it in production for how long? Uh, yeah, so it's pretty proven. Um, any other questions? Jade is so ugly. <laughs> oh, I was looking at some Jade code last night, and it's so terrible. One thing I will tell you is uh, if you use Vim, which you should, or something else, um, you can get it for just about anything. I know, I, pr I think I learned this from Matt Steele, but there's this awesome Emmet or Zen coding, which makes it so that you can write good, good HTML and it doesn't have to look like Jade. Um, so I can just say like HTML5 and then do my cool little thing and I immediately have that and then I can say I want a, a div with a class of foo and then inside of that I want a header and then inside of that I want an h1 and a huh? A sibling of h2. And a sibling of h2, yes. There you go. I think you probably could have given a better answer. All right. Thank you, Nick. <laughs>